Cool. Awesome. Welcome, everyone. This is week four of Natural Language Processing in TensorFlow. And thank you for joining us today. And if you're watching the recording later on, uh, thanks again. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach us on, on YouTube, on our, on our Meetup page, also on Slack. Um, I want to summarize or quickly go over some of the topics that we discussed on week three that um, based on our discussion, I had time to go over them and hopefully provide some more feedback and some more context. Um, I really like your, set, your questions and really helped me understand these concepts better. So last time we talked about sequence models, we talked about different architectures, one-to-one, -one, uh, the classical one that we've seen so far. And what sequence models really bring on the table is this capability to process input of any length. And that could be, they could generate, uh, um, they could generate a sequence of any length given a single input. They can take a sequence of any length and generate a single output. They can take a sequence and generate another sequence. Um, and they can also do sequence to sequence mapping. So if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, otherwise, if you don't mind, mute, mute your line. Um, we walk through this back propagation through time, and I wanted to take a deeper dive into this error, how this error uh, function is calculated, and how does it actually help us train the network? I think that's a question you had, Kathleen. So let me move our little pointer here. So what are we doing here is uh, in our sequence models, in this case, uh, a simple recurrent network, we have an initial state at zero, it's called the hidden state. And basically the goal of training is to find uh, the vector WH. There's also another vector here that's input uh, WE and also another vector that's at the output vector. Um, the, the, the symbols that I'm using or the, you know, the, the it might be slightly different. They're coming from a great course on NLP from Stanford, CS224N. I find their, um, their lectures pretty good and very well structured. So you'll see me using throughout, throughout this week and next week as well. Uh, so we have these three weights, the input weight, the hidden state weight, and the output weight matrices, and also their biases. And our goal is to find them or optimize them in a way that and they can map a sequence to sequence or a sequence to an output. So in this case, we're trying to predict, for example, in language modeling, which is a classical task for NLP, we're trying to predict the next word given a set of words. So in this case, we have the students open there. And our goal is to find the word that has the highest probability. So it could be laptops, books, uh, or something else. And the way that we calculate, in this case, the error is we look at the last time step uh, and our goal is to update uh, this weight matrices, which by the way, depend on previous iterations of the hidden state. So the hidden state changes over time because it's dependent on the input. So to calculate the, uh, the, the loss function or the cost function uh, at the fourth time step with respect to the first version of the hidden state, we have to basically do this chain rule and make sure that we take all these factors in consideration. Uh, meeting a few more people. So the change of the cost on the fourth time step depends on the second, on the third, on the fourth, and on the first, and all that. So you see this chain, chain rule here applied here. Um, I put a slide here that goes a little bit more in details, but basically we have to sum up uh, the different costs through time, if in general this is the case. Previously, I just show you for the fourth time step, but in general, you can have a cost associated with each time step. Um, and our goal is to minimize this cost. And the chain rule here again. And the problem that we saw last time was that since we have so many multiplications of the same weight matrices, especially if the sequence length is very long, your, your gradients your error, your gradient of your loss or cost function with respect to your weight matrices and biases could, could really explode or vanish depending on if these factors here are way bigger than one or way less than one. If they're way, way bigger than one, one common solution is to apply some kind of threshold uh, clipping or gradient clipping where you scale the magnitude of your gradient. You don't change the direction, you just simply scale the magnitude. So it's pointing, you know, 
10 units in one direction, you just scale it back a little bit. And there's a paper here, I, I think it's mentioned in these slides, but what that basically does is it avoids this problem that, let's say you, if your weight matrix was one dimensional and your bias was also one dimensional, if you're doing optimization, you're trying to find your W and B in such a way that minimizes your cost and causes your Y axis or error. Without clipping, you might run into an issue where your error is very high. So hopefully by keeping the Ws uh, and, and by, by clipping this gradient, you're hopefully avoiding this, this situation where your cost uh, spikes up depending if your gradient explodes or vanishes. Another approach that I've seen from, um, from another class from Stanford, this is a computer vision class actually was, instead of waiting for the entire sequence to finish and then calculate the loss and then do back propagation, um, you might actually calculate the loss for a subset of your sequence, do back propagation on that, then continue with the next set of your sequence, do back propagation through that, until you go through the very last end. So this is called truncated backpropagation through time instead of the regular backpropagation through time where you actually run your entire sequence from left to right. Um, any questions so far? These are, these are a few new slides that I introduced today. Is this, uh, this beginner friendly or? Is this? this is our third session on LP, so there's a little oh. bit of prerequisites on it. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, we've recorded our previous sessions before on, on, on YouTube, and uh, okay. I can share the link with you. Yeah, sure. Okay. Cool, then, yeah, this is the exploding or vanishing gradients problem. Um, there was another question, I think, that um, Robert raised on what is the um, importance of this weight matrix being initialized to identity matrix. That was one solution to our vanishing gradient problem. I was able to find this paper online uh, by Hinton that um, for some task, but not all, for some task using a simple recurrent neural network, non LSTM, but a vanilla RNN, gave you better results using an identity matrix. And I didn't really pull, uh, I didn't fully read the paper but um i saw some discussions online and it looked to me more of a, like a hyperparameter tuning where you make sure that you initialize your parameters properly before you even start your training and for some tasks um a simple rnn combined with identity metrics and zero biases gave you uh, similar results on lstm so george i don't know if you read enough to mo most of the time the you have those 10 h's in there mm -hmm. When he's talking about the ReLUs, is that, I guess there are some ReLUs in the, within the cell itself, right? An LSTM. There's an LSTM is sigmoids and 10Hs. Yeah, we didn't see any ReLUs. Yeah, so is he replacing the 10Hs with ReLUs? Because that's one change I think you can make. Is that what they're talking about? Um, good question. I, I don't know. I have to read the paper. It's okay, no problem. Change the activation function as well. No problem. Yep. Are ReLUs uh, similar to... So relus are like sigmoidal or uh, hyperbolic tangent. Are they like a function that you use? Yeah, relu is linear. So it's for any positive input, it's the actual input x. For any negative input, it's zero. So it's like a clipped input. I was going to mention uh, the uh, the little thing with the identity matrix on the right there the uh little playground that you mentioned at the beginning of this talk on the was it the deep learning ai site mm -hmm. the bottom, uh has a pretty cool visualization on one of their two posts is initialization and you can see some of this uh vanishing and exploding gradient phenomena there and they also present some information on why the xavier initialization works Awesome, interesting. Yeah, I was really interested in identity metrics in, in the concept of RNNs. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that I've seen initialization um, on other parts of, on other kinds of networks, but I was specifically interested in 
RNN concept. And this is the paper that I was able to find, but I haven't fully delved into it. Could, could Robert um, show us a little bit of that? Do you have it handy, Robert? Or do you want to just keep going? I mean, I, I defer to George. Uh, if, if he wants to bring that blog up and, and point to that to that spot, we could do that. Or I could send I you the can, Yeah, I can quickly go over it. Um, I, I always the, like pictures. I shared the link on our- Pictures are cool. In our chat, but- And for what it's worth, I did think the optimization post was a better viz than this one, but this one was pretty cool too. This is for deep neural network, right? I don't think there's anything on recurrent neural networks here. That's right. right. Yeah, yeah. It's just uh, just this particular, um, this one right here that we're scrolling through. If you change, I was playing around with the oh, okay. with some of the parameters here, and you could kind of see how certain situations would lead to exploding gradients. I think this one, if you if you train it uniform, right and then run it, I think you'll get exploding. Yeah. Where you can see how at every layer it's, uh, or I'm sorry, this is vanishing actually, because th those are distributions, those are histograms of the weight matrix. So they're more tightly clustered around zero the deeper you go in the network. And then if you choose another initialization scheme, they're more balanced. Yeah. Cool. There was another uh, visualization that you showed last time. You know, it had like the topographical map. You know, yeah. And just you know, if you were, can you point to that? Parameter optimization. Yeah, this was this one. So we looked at at this coast landscape. Where, I mean, I think these are like artificial landscape for cost and they depend on W1 and W2, two weights on X and Y axis. And the third axis is the actual cost function. And we saw different optimizers here. Um, we didn't experiment with different initialization techniques. Oh, is that virtualizing gradient descent? Yep, so you're looking at, yeah, simple gradient descent and other gradient descent variants that depend on first or order or second order momentum, like Adam or MS Pro. Cool. Yeah, I shared the link. Uh, feel free to take a look and also read it. It's a very well written um, blog. So yeah, please. Thanks through. for getting into that. Sure, absolutely. Let me find my pointer. Great. Um, so we talked about LSTMs and the concept of using gates to guide, to guard not only the hidden state, but LSTM introduced a new concept called a stale state, which is basically a memory for your network. And we carefully regulate how do we access that memory, how do we write into that memory, how do we read from that memory using this forget gate, update or input gate. Um, and how do we create the new output, which is really the new hidden state as well as the new uh, cell state. A slightly different um, um, description of the same problem, LSTMs from Stanford's 224N uh, or CS224N lecture. I, I like this description. Um, it's again the same similar description where we use our input X our hidden state of the previous step, a bias, weight matrices, and we, we pass them through a nonlinearity function. We calculate our, our gates, which are based on controllers, of how much information should flow. If it's zero, means that no information should flow through that gate. If it's one, that means that all information should, should flow through that gate. And it kind of pairs it back to this uh, information flow here of your current input, your previous hidden state, you pass it this non-linearities, you calculate your new cell state, and that's basically your, your hard disk, your, your, your memory of your cell. And hopefully that will help us remember long-term dependencies, which is one of the issues that vanilla RNNs uh, suffer from. 
Another variant of RNNs that I didn't show last time, but quickly uh, skim through it, is the gated recurrent unit. Um, the, the equations are here. Uh, you see that they've combined a few uh, gates. You don't have now four, but you have like an update gate, a reset gate, and you don't, um, you don't have a cell state. You just have a hidden state. But you carefully regulate how the hidden state is created and updated. Um, this is a little bit faster than an LSTM, has less parameters, and it's a little bit faster to train. Um, I've seen a little bit comparable uh, results, but usually I've seen most papers or most applications using LSTMs compared to gated recurrent units or GRUs. Can I ask you something? Yeah. Um, on the LSTM, and I think, I think Lawrence briefly touched on it, but I've seen it other places. They say the beauty, the beauty of the LSTM, one of the main things of it is that because of the cell state, you backprop goes smoothly versus, I guess, an RNN. I don't get much about that. I don't see the, see the difference. I, do, do you understand that at all? Yeah, I have a slide on that right in a few seconds. I'm, I'm sorry, did you say you, say you already addressed it? No, I have, I have a slide. I added a few more slides on that. Yep. Okay, fine. Sure. Thank you. Good question, though. So, yeah. So, regarding the gradient flow, um, and actually regarding the vanishing and exploding gradients, and is this something specific to recurrent neural networks, or is it just a deep learning challenge that we have to deal with? It's actually bigger than that. It's actually a deep learning challenge. Not all, all neural architectures might suffer from an exploding or vanishing gradient problem. It is specifically an issue in recurrent neural networks because if you remember last time, we used the same weight matrices again and again and again. In other uh, neural networks, um, as, as Robert mentioned last time, each layer has their own weight matrices. So if you have a, a collection of convolution layers, each layer has their own weight matrices. So you, you might not necessarily learn run into this issue uh, or you might not run as, as fast as you might run into an RNN. And uh, in dense networks, in DNNs, um, there, there have been some papers, uh, if you remember the ResNet architecture, which used skip connections, which basically um, allowed future layers in the architecture to have access to earlier layers without going through uh, all the necessary steps. So that allowed the network to actually calculate the identity function faster. And it allowed it to also not suffer from this vanishing or exploding gradients as much as without it. Is the identity function the same as the uh, hypothesis? The identity function means that your network, if you give X, you should, you should output X pretty reasonably like you shouldn't have any difficulty creating that it, it, it is easy for us to think so especially from a mathematical perspective but for for a deep learning network it's not that easy uh, another one another um, way of tackling this vanishing and exploding gradient in in regular networks is if you add what's called dense connections where you basically you allow your future layers to have access to previous layers. So for example, here the, the layer in red will propagate its output not only in the next layer, the second, but also in the third, the fourth, and the fifth, and so forth. So this architecture uh, built on this kind of connections is called a dense net, and it, it helps a little bit with the vanishing exploding gradient on regular networks. Another one is called the highway connection. It was actually inspired by LSTMs where you use gates to propagate your information forward in layers. So, so yeah, in, in general, the vanishing gradient, exploding gradient is a, is a general problem. It's, it's particularly a big problem in RNNs because you multiply the same way three weight matrices again and again. Uh, and then getting back to your question, Martin, about uh, the gradient flow. Um, if you do this kind of architecture where you allow, where you skip connections basically, then when you calculate the gradients, you, part of the gradient will still have to go through this part, but part of it, as you see, will hopefully 
uh, overcome it and, and go back and update your weight matrices in a much faster, much easier way uh, compared to not having the skip connections. So it's not that you resolve the, the, the vanishing gradient problem altogether, it's, it's just that you rely on your network to overcome it a little bit better. Cool. Then there was some feedback. Remember, Robert, we talked a little bit about how do we combine outputs when we're talking about bidirectional LSTMs. So I put a slide here on a simple network, which is comprised of a forward RNN and it's reading the, the sentence. The movie was terribly exciting. So if you can, you can imagine if we try to read this sentence from left to right, one token at a time, the movie was terribly, probably if we output it, the, the sentiment here would be probably negative. Or if you wait till the end of it, exciting, terribly exciting, I'm not sure what would happen with that combination. So we have one network reading the sentence from left to right, as we do. And then we have another network in green here, reading the sequence from right to left. And each one of them comes up with their own hidden states, their own weight matrices, their own biases. And then based on our problem, if this is a, a N to one or N to N problem, in this case, um, it looks like it's an N to N where you have a sequence as an input and you want to output a sequence. You combine the outputs of both the forward network and the backward network into one large output, a concatenated version of it. So in this case, if you look at the word or the context of terribly, it depends both on context coming before it and also context coming after it. So yeah, so you have a one neural network that does the forward uh, pass, one that does the backward pass, and then the your combined output of your network is just a concatenation of these hidden states. So should you use bidirectional in like, is there, is there a rule? Should you use unidirectional? Like what, what should we do? Um, if, you're, if you have access to the entire input sequence, usual input sequence, usually combining uh, forward RNA and backward RNA gives you slightly different, slightly better results. If your problem um, is not solved by, or you don't have access to the entire input, for example, when you do language modeling, where you're trying to predict the next word or the next token, you can you cannot run this right you don't have access to the future words so you have to go with the forward rnn approach and more recent approaches like for example use bidirectionality as one of their main features excuse me would would there be a case where if you were to run a backward rnn as well um it would uh just i guess fail to help the um, effectiveness of the model but not hurt it or is and it just becomes computationally expensive or is this something that um, would actually be a, to a detriment to if you didn't need to say see future um, look, look look forward into the data set mm -hmm. um, for example or, or maybe you could just help me straighten that out so usually from applications that I've seen um, it really depends on, on your data. Again, yeah, I agree with you. You computationally, you, you have double the parameters and double the, the, the steps. But if you have access to the entire corpus, let's say you have news uh, data set and you're trying to predict like sentiment or something like that, um, I would imagine you'd get better results using a bidirectional RNN. Like it could be RNN, LSTM, GRU, it could be any, you know, any variant of RNN. But, if your token is you're typing something and you predict the next word, or you're reading maybe something as a sequence, maybe I don't know, like a stock price, you don't have yeah the ability to go uh, backwards. That temporal oriented data that there's no need to think about the future or something like stock <laughs> price ex example where you don't you don't need to think of it globally, whereas you do in language. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Either you don't think you don't need to think about it globally or you don't have access to future values. I mean, that doesn't mean that you, you cannot, for example, run a bidirectional on all the values you've seen so far, but um, usually 
all applications I've seen is it's more data dependent if you have access to your entire input sequence or not. If you do, bidirectionality usually helps. If you don't, you just go with a forward RNA. Yeah, I, I would just add to that that the general lesson from machine learning applies. Like it all depends, right? Yeah. If your forward RNN is badly overfitting already, then giving it even more parameters to play with probably isn't is yeah. going to make it even less likely to generalize. That's a good point. Absolutely, yeah. you're basically doubling the capacity of the network. So if you're overfitting here, you're twice as much overfit with a dual RNA or bidirectional RNN, I should say. Cool. Uh, another type of network architecture that we saw is a stacked version of RNNs where we have um, an input sequence and that passes through, in this case, a unidirectional RNN. And the output of that sequence is actually fed as input to, an, to another completely different network, uh, network layer. In this case, another RNN layer. Um, it does its own calculation, has its own weight matrices and biases. And the output of that is passed to a third RNN layer, which, which could do either a classification. In that case, we're only interested in the last uh, layer or the last uh, step of the hidden state. Or if you're doing some kind of sequence generation, we're actually interested in all the intermediate outputs. What does RNA stand for? RNN, sorry. Uh, recurrent neural network. Okay. Yep. Yeah. If you watch our last week's recording, I'll show you, you'll, you'll be able to catch up. Cool. Then this is just a note that RNNs are deep in the sense that they process uh, sequence so the sequence could be of arbitrary length and another way of making them deeper is if you add a horizontal um, layer to it so basically if you stack them on top of each other so this allows your network to learn even more complex representations like we've seen in convolution neural networks where you look at an image and in the beginning you're learning some very low level features but then as you go higher higher in your net network architecture you're actually trying to distinguish in like bags or shoes or different kind of clothes in the fashion of this data set. So just a note on some papers that high performing RNAs are often multi-layer. Multi it's, it's simply because you have higher, your, your, your network capacity is much higher, but also you have this hierarchical approach where you learn simple features, intermediate features and more advanced features in your network. And some papers back in 2017 that uh, for machine translations, two to four layers was, was a good approach for an encoder and four layers for a decoder. And uh, we'll see what that means. But basically what that means is that you don't see as deep recurrent neural networks as you see for convolution neural networks. Uh, you see deep neural net, uh, deep uh, layers when you go to newer architectures like BERT, which have up to 12 to 24 layers. But usually for RNNs, it's up to four or five. Just a joke here that I really find, found funny, I thought, I thought to share it with you, but um, in this class, this CS224, and they talk about vanilla RNNs, <laughs> they talk about vanilla ice cream as well. They talk about different flavors like GRU, LSTM, and multi-layer RNNs where you stack them on top of each other. Then they said that in the end of their course, you'll be able to understand what stacked bidirectional LSTM with residual networks and self-attention means. We haven't talked about self-attention, but they show this picture, which is basically like all the combinations you've seen together and all the toppings. <laughs> That's good. That's that was good. a good job. Like, okay, maybe that. <laughs> um, some reference to Andrew Eng's deep learning uh, specialization. It goes a little bit in, in more theoretical detail of how the recurrent neural network is structured and how it does LSTMs and GRU work. I briefly mentioned these two papers that explore different variations of LSTMs and GRUs. I was able to find this visualization of another paper that this is the existing information flow for an LSTM cell, and this is another cell that we we're able to find that for some tasks perform better than LSTM. So as a reminder, both or all three of these papers, the, the conclusion is that for some tasks, there are different uh, neural architectures that give you better results, but not across the board, not for all tasks. 
Cool. I wanted to introduce this visualization. I think it helped me a lot understand what happened with the actual code in TensorFlow. So we'll start with, let me get my pointer. There you go. We'll start with this approach here where we have, or this part of the uh, visualization where we have a sequence and a sequence could be a sentence. We have tokenized it, meaning we have separated by tokens. We have, I really love deep learning, and this is just the input. Another sentence here, another sentence here, and we have three samples, and that could be our batch size, for example. When we do our tokenization, we actually assign numbers to each of these tokens. We assign these numbers W3, W2, W8, W100, and that could be integers. That's what the tokenizer does in TensorFlow. These are now just integers. You could just literally think of them as the number three, number two, number eight, number 100. Uh, to actually work with them, we need to convert them to uh, vectors. And we do that using an embedding layer. Go ahead. Uh, the way we tokenize the phrase uh, into numbers, uh, how do we do that? Like, what do, is it just like randomized or is it like each particular word is correlated with a particular number? Yeah, so TensorFlow has a tokenizer um, object that looks at your entire corpus, looks at your, and really ranks them in popularity. So which word appeared the most? Let's say the word I, you'll assign it the value one. Then the second most popular really, value two, value three, value four, up until either the end of your corpus, or you can specify, I want to just tokenize, or I just want to embed the first hundred most popular words. So now from integers, we want to go to vectors. And really we do this because this gives us way more flexibility and also allows us to manipulate our input sequence in, 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 more, uh, in more dimensions. So we do that through the embedding layer, which basically all it does is, again, remember this X axis going down is the samples. We have three sentences. Going to the right is the actual time steps of how many tokens each sentence has. So the first one is one, two, three, four. This is just padding. Then the embedding layer, all it does is it, it maps these integers to a higher dimensional space. And this, you can control how deep or how complex you want your representation to be. And that could be, you know, usually we've seen 32, 64, 100, like you really could go deep. And the deeper you go, the more expressive your embeddings are, the more things you can do with it, but also come, they come with a computational cost. And then what you're giving in your RNNs is actually you're giving one sentence at a time, but also one token at a time that's now embedded in this uh, high dimensional space. We actually we're giving it a vector as an input. So you're giving the word I really love, and hopefully the, your recurrent neural network should be able to predict the next word whatever that might be. Could I ask you something? Um, yeah. Is there, when they describe embedding dimensions, it seems like, as you just said, you just kind of arbitrarily pick them and they seem to be powers of two, 32, 64, 128. Is there an intuition for what that, I don't really understand what it is. Um, is there some intuition about it? Um, yeah, so if you remember, yeah, last time when we were doing movie reviews, we we're classifying movie reviews into positive and negative or tweets into positive and negative. Yeah. Uh, we could have done that with just integers, but that doesn't give a lot of flexibility to your network of basically finding a decision, a decision a boundary that these integers are, have good sentiment, these integers have negative sentiment because they're basically integers on a line. Um, when we explored richer dimensionality representations, we saw that your neural network was able to shape them or distinguish them much, much better compared to just a single dimensional representation. Yeah, okay, yeah, I, I did kind of understand that result. I, um, you know, just in a sense, more is better and, you know, but you can't do too many because it's computationally difficult, but still is grappling with what it is. But anyway, I think that that's, you know, that's fine. Yeah, and if you read the, the glove paper or, or some, some blog posts around it and also like either embedding, embeddings you see, you'll see that when you try to solve for a, for a problem, uh, 
actually your representations might come closer to each other based on the problem you're trying to solve. So that's how you saw those um, geometrical representations of uh, man, queen, king, and right. so before. So this, they actually inherit a lot of information just by the problem you're trying to solve. Okay. All right, thanks. Sure. Then taking a little bit of a uh, more detailed view here on the embedding layer and TensorFlow. Um, so we're looking at the IMDb, IMDb reviews here, the 8K uh, vocabulary size, and we have a training set and test data set, and we're trying to predict if this review is positive or negative. Um, I wanted to look at the embedding layer here that basically does exactly what we said above. It converts positive indexes into dense vectors of a fixed size, and you can specify that, that size. So they take an input dimension um, and they create an output dimension. So in this case, uh, we have a thousand sentences or a thousand, our sample size is a thousand. The, uh, sorry, the input size is a thousand. The output dimension is 64. And when we pass it through this, this layer, um, let's see. So we have 32 sentences in this case. This is our input, 32 by 10. We have 32 sentences, there are 10, um, the dimensionality is 10. We pass it to this embedding layer. Um, we're gonna get, again, 32 by 10 by the dimensionality of um, the output dimensionality of the, of the embedding. So this is where that bigger is better that, we, that, that you talked about before, Martin. So in this case, we're just using 64 dimensional embedding. So the input again is batch size input length. The output is batch size input length, a third dimension, which is the output dimension. Where is the tokenization in that example? It's not, it's not shown here, it was done, it was done before. Oh, okay. Yep. So under the very simple network that we saw is just looking at um, embeddings that initially are random, but as the network trains, you can actually learn, your network can learn these embeddings. Um, we flatten them, we pass them through a dense neural network, and we saw that the a review classification accuracy was pretty much low, it was 54%. And we're a little bit overfitting. You see the gap between the training and the validation series here. Then we added a bidirectional LSTM layer and in the bidirectional, uh, if you look at the layer in, in TensorFlow, you have something called a merge mode and that could be one of the sum, multiply, concatenate, average or none and by default it's concatenate. All that means is that you're running a recurrent neural network from left to right, another one from right to left and you're combining the hidden state from each layer you're concatenating them, and that is your, actually your output of this bidirectional LSTM layer. So we, we saw when we did that, we, we got yeah. about 80% accuracy. If you choose one of the other options there, then your, your, uh, your uh, state vector then is not double the size for bidirectional, right? Yeah, so if you do sum, yeah, it will be the same size. Hmm. Multiply, same size. Average, same size, none. Um, I'm not sure when you use none. Um, oh, if none, the apples will be combined. But I'm not sure what the combine means. I thought concatenate to me looks like you're combining them. So, oh, right. not be combined, sorry. Combined. It'll be written as a list. Okay. So that means that you'll have two outputs and you can do with them whatever you want. So if sum, multiply, concat, average isn't what you want to do, you want to do your own combination of the outputs of these two recurrent neural networks, you can do that on your own. If you want to do expon exponentials or some other mathematical equation, you can do that. But presumably if you choose something like average or sum, uh, that would allow you to take advantage of the bidirectionality while maybe having a similar state representation, right? It's the same 
it's the same size vector, yeah. but maybe not allowing it that extra, all those extra degrees of freedom where it might overfit more. Correct. Yep. Yep. Can you explain that? Can you just do another sentence on that? I think I understood you, but could you explain that more? So, I, I mean, I, I wasn't aware of merge mode until I saw it here a minute ago. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it appears that concat is the only one of those options that uh, you know builds a vector which is twice as long. If you have an LSTM bidirectional and you choose concat, then your output state is actually 128 neurons. Whereas if you choose some mole or average, then you are doing an operation to combine each of the sure. each of the neurons so that you have a 64 by 64 by one vector that is being output there so i guess another way to think of that is that if you concat there's no relation between um neuron number 37 for the forward network versus neuron number 37 for the backward network because they're really just being concatenated into one big long vector whereas if you sum them or average them or do something else you're performing an operation and therefore you're you're implying or imposing a relationship that's going to have a different possible different effect in some to some degree yeah exactly yep so this is a visualization for concatenating you're actually going from 64 dimensional vector to a 128 dimensional vector mm -hmm. If you take the average, you take the average of the red and the green vector. We can do um, point-wise multiplication, point-wise summation. So at least in theory, it seems like one could choose a different size for the backward RNN versus the forward RNN if you were concatenating, but you can't do that if you choose sum or multiply or average. Yeah. Awesome. Let's go back. Um, there was another comment on, again, we're still on week three, and there was another comment on, I think, yeah, it was you, Robert, on do we take the actual the last output of each layer, or do we take the first output, or do we take all of them, or do we take just the middle? And I mentioned that the forward one would output the last hidden layer the backward one and output the, the hidden layer on the first token and that would be your and then you concatenate those and that would be your output. Um, so if you do send this classification that's one approach in this case this is just unidirectional where you take the last one. Uh, if it's bidirectional this would be a combination of the last and the first token. Uh, usually for uh, for I've seen architectures where you don't just look at the last output, but you actually look at all intermediate outputs or hidden states for a network. And usually you do some kind of like element wise max or mean of all the hidden states. Usually that gives you a little bit of a better performance when you're doing, for example, uh, sentence classification. And actually this is, a this is a precursor of something called the attention model where you actually look at different inputs, not just the last one. You actually look at different inputs and you cite different weight matrices of how much should the input at, at step X or two in this case uh, impact the, uh, the classification output. I just thought to share that here. Cool. Yeah, it's, uh, this is kind of where I wanted to I had a question about or go back or go ahead, whatever, they just show the graphs, you know, the, the accuracy and uh, loss graph that you were just Sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. That okay. Before first, you showed the single direction, and it was crappy. It was fifty percent by 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 chance, and then you showed bidirectional, and I guess that's what that is right there. And both look much better, like like eighty five percent. So, just double checking, you know that. That's a big deal, right? So, so bi-directional is the way to go then, right? 
Yeah, and actually, I jumped. I jumped ahead from no RNN to a bidirectional RNN. I sh maybe I could have included one that just has a single RNN. Uh, no RNN was the. Yeah, no RNN. Fifty-four yeah. percent. So oh, okay. So no RNN to one RNN, which is bidirectional, to two RNNs, which both of them are bidirectional. They're stacked. Okay. So we went, I guess, maybe two steps ahead. Yeah, well, that's one RNN unidirectional might be an interesting thing to look at. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I think in my code, I, have, I, I experimented and it was less than this, probably. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And a reminder on convolution, because this took me a little bit of uh, time to understand the, the convolutional 1D. Um, so as a reminder, this is related to image processing, has nothing to do with time series, but just, just to orient ourselves and give us a better understanding of, of how the convolution operation works in, a, in an image setup where you actually have an image made up of a red, a green, and a blue channel. It's basically uh, volume. And you have your filters or your kernels for your convolution, and they have to match the, the channel dimensionality but they could be any width and any height. So in this case, our input is six by six by three. Our kernel could be anything, could be x by y by three. That's the only limitation. And these numbers here, they're learned by your network. And what they do is, you see this yellow volume here, they actually pass through each three by three patch volume of your input. They multiply the weights with the input. They add up all the numbers and you come up with just a single number that's your output. So you do that for different steps. You go um, horizontally and vertically, you go to the right and down, and you come up with a four by four output. So you had a volume of six by six by three, you had another volume of three by three by three. Um, your output is a four by four number. If you do this multiple times for multiple kernels, this is just one kernel or one convolutional filter. If you do this with two filters, you're gonna end up with um, a four by four by two output. You can add a bias on the first kernel. You can add a bias on the second output. You can pass that through a ReLU function, and that's your output of your convolutional operation. And I have a visualization here that this is our R part or the red part or the one channel of the input, the second channel of the input, the third channel of the input. We need three filters, and we have two, two filters. Both of them are three by three. And you see the operation here multiplying. You're getting a number, you're multiplying nine numbers together, you're getting a number. There's no bias, I think, here or no linearity. What does C N N stand for? Convolutional neural networks. Convolutional. Convolutional. Okay. Yeah. That's a couple of weeks ago on our recordings. Uh, I wanted to mention that because now we'll be dealing with um, with uh, sequences, and we'll be doing something called a one deconvolution. Um, and if you look on the TensorFlow documentation, it takes this input number of filters. Could be before we had two filters. It takes this input the kernel size of how wide your kernel should be, how many tokens you should look at a time. So it helped me look at this visualization here, where you're you have basically a sequence of tokens. That's your input. How long or how wide is your kernel? That's your kernel size. The filters is how many filters you have. So how many times can you do this in parallel? What you're doing is you're multiplying this, these three numbers here with three parts of your input and you're calculating that number. You can pass it through a bias and nonlinearity later on. But this helped me visualize the, the 1D part of it. Um, another one was it, it, just to be clear on that, that this is kind of like the embedding dimensions thing for me. I, I, I didn't quite, I've never quite understood what the filters parameter is. And, and did you just say that, what, okay, so you, you have your kernel size mm -hmm. and you have your image mm -hmm. and then you scan it once and then you, and is that the first filter and then you move it over and you do it again? And is that a second filter? So filter is basically how many times you see this image, how many times you want to do this in parallel with completely different kernels, with completely different numbers here. 
So mm -hmm. this is just one snapshot. Think of it as another one next to it, but the numbers now are different. There are three of them, but they're, they're different. So like in, in our case, when we had the, the 2D convolution, uh, we had two filters. So our filters argument was two. And each one of them has completely different numbers. Like they're looking, maybe one filter is looking for vertical lines, another one is looking for horizontal lines, another one is looking for curves, another one is looking for uh, round shapes, could be different features they're looking for. Okay. So this filter is basically, think of it as like a parallelization factor for how many such scannings and multiplications and basically how many convolution operations you want to do in parallel and that will that will dictate your output shape okay so in this case if your input is 4 by 10 by 128 so let's say you have four sentences they have, they're 10 tokens long and they're embedded so that means that they're 128 dimensional vectors your output will be again four sentences that will never change Due to this uh, convolution, you might do some padding or you might, you might omit the very first and the very last token like you did in the image where you couldn't really go around the image. So your input now is instead of 10, came down to eight. And then the last dimension is how many times you want to do this in parallel. That was your filters input, that was 32. So the input is batch size steps input dimension. The output is batch size new steps that could be updated if you use padding or not. And the third dimension is filters. Makes more sense? Yeah, thanks. Sure. Then somehow we need some kind of operation to bring down the dimension of all these vectors. And TensorFlow has uh, average pooling and global average pooling. I think we've used average pooling 2D in convolution neural networks, but all that all that does is instead of multiplying now with uh, this kernel, we're actually taking the average of um, of our input. So this pool size specifies how many tokens you want to look at a time. Two, three, four. In this image, we're looking at three tokens of our input at a time. We will not be multiplying them with anything. We're just going to take the average of that number of these three tokens or these three numbers. That'll be our output. A special case of average pooling 1D is the global average pooling 1D, where your pool size is your entire sequence length. So you're not looking at, for example, two tokens or three tokens at a time. You're looking at the entire input sequence and calculating the average. So it's basically an average function. Yeah, I mentioned that because we use them in this network where we had an embedding layer and then we had a conf D. 128 by five. So 128 here, that means that we're gonna do 128 different convolutions in parallel, and both of them will be looking at five tokens at a time. Then the output of that will be a very long, uh, it's followed by a global average pooling. So if you look at dimensions here is the embedding, the output will be that size uh, by the sequence length, by the dimensionality of it, which I, in this case is 64. Then after conf 1D is the batch size, we don't know, that's why it's, it's none here, could be any length. Um, this none here will be, um, again, any length, but we were using 128 filters, that's why this output, this third dimension is 128. George? Yep. Um, could you go back to that last slide are, are you saying that if you're doing average pooling, you, is it, so you apply the filter and in this diagram here, you multiply the 101 times the tokens, which was 100, you get one. You slide it, you do the same thing, you keep doing it, you fill up that line on um, the output. And then, then you take the average of, of each, then you do the averaging after that. Is that right? Yeah, so the average pooling and the global average pooling, there, there's no kernel here. There's absolutely no kernel. All you're doing is a mathematical function uh, average. Yeah. I, I should have omitted I, I don't think that's, that's not how it is with the 
2D come from CNMs. So you do the, you do the filtering, and then you then you reduce the the size of the image um, by averaging or max pooling or whatever. But you you do the the filtering. You're saying here that you don't filter. I, I'm just mentioning here what does the layer average pooling does on its own. Without, After filtering. Yeah, without anything else. Yeah, I'm not combining. You're right. Usually you you have some kind of convolutional function followed by some kind of pooling function. I was, okay. just, I was just going over the documentation of what do they take as input, what do they generate as output. Okay. And here yeah. I'm actually combining them. Yeah, conf with global average point. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And I'm passing that to a downstream network. And we saw that the accuracy was again 87%, but it was a little bit better behaving than, than the, the stack bidirectional or single bidirectional layer. Then we stack two convolutional layers, so one convolutional uh, looking at five tokens at a time, followed by another convolution looking at three tokens at a time. It just so happened that we're running 128 in parallel here, 128 in parallel here, followed by a global average pooling. And the behavior was a little bit more stable, but still we're in that 87% range for validation accuracy. And you can see that we're overfitting because our training and validation accuracy and loss are diverging. Then we tried a dropout layer um, that might have helped a little bit. It's hard to tell, but those were the kind of different architectures we tried. No RNN, a single bidirection RNN, two stack bidirection RNNs, one cone of D, two cone of D, one cone of D with dropout. Cool. That was the IMDB reviews data set that we, we talked about the tweet, the 1.6 million tweet data set. Now we're trying to classify, to classify the sentiment behind a tweet, zero and one, positive or negative. We talked about, instead of learning our own embeddings, we use these pre learned embeddings. And that, so with our own embeddings, we got in this new data set about 77% best case accuracy. With the new embeddings, uh, we dropped in accuracy actually, but in many cases, we're not overfitting anymore. And I think the best case we found was for an LSTM, 77, 76, 75. We could see that we, uh, 76, like, that was like almost like a wall that we couldn't really come across. Cool, that was week three. <laughs> uh, hopefully that was, that gave you some more context of some of the uh, topics we covered last week. Any questions before we actually start with week four? Oh. oh, that was the review of last week? Yeah, that was a review with some uh, extra edit uh, content that I found online based on the feedback that I received from last week. Cool, let's see, we only have half an hour. <laughs> so, this week, last week, of course, three is about sequence models and literature on basically applications of the models that we've seen. Name all this on the side so you can see. And I wanted to talk a little bit about one of the tasks, one, uh, one of the NLP tasks I will be dealing with here, pointer. And it's called language modeling. So we've talked about it, but just to put it into notation, so language modeling is the task of predicting what word comes next in a sentence. So you could have an input sentence of the students open there and based on your training corpus could be one of these books, laptops, could be something else that come in your mind. So more formally giving a sequence of, um, of words and in this case, X1 is word or the first token, X2 is the second token, X is the teeth token. We want to compute the probability distribution of the next token, xt plus one, given all the previous tokens. And our goal is to find the token that maximizes probability. So this xt plus one can be any word in, in our vocabulary. In, if our vocabulary is small, probably this would be something like an out of vocabulary token. So a system that does this, that solve this problem of maximizing this next probability very well is called a, a language model. And where is language model used? When you type in your, in your phone and you start typing, you see that keyboard is actually 
recommending the next order type. When you're looking for something online, you see that your search results might be um, might be recommending you what is the next word. And just a note here on the pre deep learning area, um, how would you calculate this probability? You basically look at your entire corpus. You look at what are called n-grams, which is basically a combination of tokens. You look at unigrams, meaning you look at one token at a time, one word at a time. You look at bigrams, which is two tokens or two words at a time, three words at a time, four words at a time. And you basically calculate statistics of how often does the word, the students open their books appear, if it appears in your corpus, how often does the, the word or the sentence the students open there appear, and you do their ratio. So that was a pre-deep learning era uh, solution. In, in the deep learning solution is you have using a recurrent neural network, you're feeding it one token at a time, you could be in these hidden states, hidden states, hidden states, and then, then at the end, you are sampling or you are predicting basically the, the, the index of the word from your vocabulary. And hopefully if you train your network well, you're gonna get one of the most plausible or plausible outputs. So we talked about the advantage of this was that it takes any length as input. Um, uh, theoretically, it can track information for many steps back, but we saw that in, in reality, it, it, it suffers from the vanishing creating problem. That's why we have to deal with, um, well, we have to explore LSTMs or GRUs or different initialization techniques. In terms of evaluating these models, uh, how do we know that our language model is doing a good job? There's a metric called uh, perplexity, which is basically the inverse probability of our next word. And we do this for all the different words that we're trying to predict. So if we're looking at the next word we're trying to predict and, and the next one and the next one and the next one, if we look at the inverse probability of those, um, there's a normalization here that takes place that is called the per perplexity. And this normalization, I think if you omit it in, in, in the course, and they mentioned that this will go out of bound and your perplexity will become higher and higher. So what you want is you, you want a lower per perplexity. That's how you can tell that your model is doing a good job. And there's a relationship between your cross entropy loss and your perplexity. So the exponent, the exponent, the exp of your and the cross entropy loss is actually your perplexity. So they're directly related. So that means that um, high cross entropy loss means high perplexity. That, that is bad for your model. Low cross entropy loss means low perplexity, which is good for your model. And some papers here from 2013 all the way to 2016. You can see that the Ngram models, the pre-deep learning era, they, were, they had about 67 perplexity. Again, this is not percentage, this is just a number. Um, and then using RNN, so you can use a one layer RNN, it would achieve 43 perplexity. A two layer RNN, like a stack uh, LSTM, 30. Um, and then a small LSTM or a large LSTM, 39. That was back in 2016. Where can you use language modeling? The uh, perplexity there is related to entropy, right? That's the like the number of bits that you need to to encode it. No, this is cross entropy loss of you're trying to predict the next word. Uh, so you have a label, and then you have your so you're, you, you're, you're outputting a probability distribution on the next word. Uh, the label is a probability distribution which has one on the right output and zero everywhere else. You look at the difference between those, that's your cross entropy loss. It's the, the same one we've seen all along. Mm -hmm. But once you, once you tip raise the exponential on that, I think that uh, becomes equivalent to the uh, information theoretic concept of entropy. Oh. Right? Um, yeah, I, I know that entropy is information theoretic concept, but maybe. Um, so you're saying the perplexity and the loss have some kind of information theoretic relationship apart from the exponent, exponential relationship here? 
I think so. Maybe it's not the number of maybe it's not the number of bits, but it's the total number of it's like it's like equivalent to to rolling a die with that many options or something. So if the the, the perplexity of a six sided die is six, because mm -hmm. all the options are equally likely. Mm -hmm. um, if it's not a fair die, then the perplexity goes down. Got it. Okay. Then in terms of applications of language modeling, um, it's just a subcomponent. It's usually used as a subcomponent of other NLP tasks where we saw when we, when you try to predict the next word when you're typing or when you hear, when you're trying to do speech recognition, where you're trying to decode audio to text, um, which word is actually most probable based on maybe some unclear audio that you might have, or when you do handwriting, based on your handwriting, which word is actually the one that you're trying to write based on previous words. Uh, and some other applications that, that I found interesting, I just included them here. So for, in our case, we will look at um, sonnets from Shakespeare. And in this week, Lawrence uh, showed us how to uh, access this, this data set. And I just included one sonnet here for your, for your example, where you can see it. um, it's not a long each sentence, uh, maybe six, seven words long. And you can see the, the kind of words and the kind of um, uh, artistic you know, flavor that this, this, this corpus has. So what we did then is we read this, this, um, this corpus of data. Let's get our pointer. We split it on new line. Uh, that means that now our, our data has one sentence. Uh, each index is one sentence. And we use the tokenizer to basically assign an integer to each word. Then we calculated something called here for each word, for each sentence now, we'll look at the length of that sentence. And we calculate something that we saw above, which is called the n-gram. So we're trying to see what is the first word, what is the first two words, what is the first three words, what is the first four words. So basically we're doing all combinations for a given sentence. So in, for example, for the first sentence, the n-gram sequence would be from, the next one would be from Ferris, the next one would be from Ferris creatures, and so forth. And what we do is actually we store all these n-grams. So now we're not only storing each sentence, but we're also storing the n-gram version of each sentence. So we jump now from, let's say, in this case, 20 sentences to 20 times whatever the n-gram complexity might be here. Then what we do is we use our, we break down an n-gram into the first but the last. So we basically extract the last part. We use that as our label. And all the previous ones right here will be our predictors or our features. So in this case, if one of the n-gram was from Ferris creatures, we desire increase. We take the very last word or token as our label and all the previous ones as our features. So we do that and we come up with, I think about 3000 different combinations of, of words here in this example. George, can you explain that a little? Why, why do you choose the last one? Is that just like you pick a random one so you take the last yeah. one to generate a data set or why do that? So we're doing language modeling. So in language modeling, right. is our input is a sentence, our output is the next word. Okay, yeah. So somehow we have to construct our features and our labels. So our features, like the easiest thing to do is maybe look at one, two, three, four, like your network has never seen a, sentences before. So in the beginning, we'll see the token from, and it's to figure out, okay, what is usually followed after from? It could be first, it could be country name, it could be something else. That will be your, your training set. So you're training it on one token, one sentence, two sentences, but give me the third, oh, sorry, one word, give me the second word, two words, give me the third, three, give me the, the fourth, and give me the N plus one. You're just training it on multiple oh. different n -grams. 
So, and because of the way um, like exhausts all the possibilities starting at the beginning and running a sequence, it makes sense to take the final one as the, the, the thing you're trying to predict because it just fits yep. with the way we're tokenizing it using n-grams. Yeah, so you're taking one sentence and you're, you're basically augmenting it. You're taking all possible n-grams. You're, you're, you're starting with one, one, two, one, two, three, and yeah, yeah. the goal is to predict the follow-up. George, you also start uh, two, three, two, three, four, three, four, three, four, five, right? So you have an engram from Ferris, but you also have Ferris creatures and uh, creatures we. Yeah, you could do that in the code here. Uh, I don't, I don't see, but probably that would increase your data set and actually maybe your accuracy. So that's a good, that's a good point. So from for I in range. So yeah, so you look yeah. at your sentence. Um, this is just one sentence. So for each line in your corpus, um, make it a sequence. Then for each token in that sequence, look at uh, look at the I. So in the beginning, the I will be zero. So it'll be look at the very first mm -hmm. word. Then append it to your list. Look at the first two words. Append them to your list. Look at the first three words, append them to your list, look at the first fourth words until you go So, to... So when i is equal to two. Yeah. So when i equals to two, this dot dot notation means everything yeah, up to. Right. Everything. Right. So it, it doesn't show it um, doing what I said. I, I, I thought when they used n-grams that they did every combination. Yeah, I think that's the exhaustive approach. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. Okay. Yeah. Actually, I'm curious now if I implement that change, if I'll get better accuracy. So I, I can give it a try. <laughs> cool. Um, so what kind of network are we using here? But be, before we talk about the network, what we're trying to do is we're trying to fit or we're trying to use the predictors, which was again, this input sequence, except for the last token, all combinations that we've seen. And our labels are the last tokens of all combinations that we've seen. So it could be one or two word combinations, three word combinations, four word combinations, and so forth. So we're trying to predict given features, what is the actual next word that's in the label. That's what we're trying to do. And this is a list of vectors, this is a list of vectors. So using sequence models, um, we use embeddings here to convert to represent them in, in a higher dimensional space. We use a bidirectional STM layer of 150 units. That's the dimensionality of the cell state in an STM. And the larger this is, the more capacity your network has. We use a return sequence equals two because we want to stack another LSTM after this. So we actually want the entire output of your RNA, not just the last uh, token output. Before then, we use a dropout layer of 20%. We follow up with an LSTM, a unidirectional LSTM in this case of 100 units, um, followed by a DNN, a deep neural network of um, total words divided by two total words were about 3,000. So this would be a 1,500. And this is 3,000 because remember now we want to output one of the words. So our softmax need to actually go from, I need to pick up one of the plausible words in our vocabulary. Our vocabulary is about 3,000 words long. So you would start from, let's say, A, if that letter was in the dictionary, two would be another vocabulary word, E would be another vocabulary word, the would be another vocabulary word. We have total words, that many words in our vocabulary, 3,112 or 3,211. And then the goal of this network is to give us a probability distribution across these 3,000 um, words, and we would pick up the highest one, and that we would predict that would be the next word. So the closest to this visualization is this one here, where the very last layer, think of it, there's a DNN here, but that DNN has an output of 3,000 uh, units or 3,000 neurons, and each one of them, which, whichever one has the highest value, we look at that index, that correspond to a word, we'd predict that word is the next one. So usually you've seen 
in, in classification, our output was actually two or one neurons. In this case, we have 3,000. Because we're trying to predict one of the words in our vocabulary. Cool. So this whole network has six million parameters. And when we try to when we train it for a hundred epochs, we see the training accuracy. We didn't split this into training and validation accuracy, but we only had one entire data set. We saw the accuracy about 80% and the loss gradually falling and falling and falling. So we think we're doing a good job. We're, we're doing a good job of given any combination of sub words or sub sentences, we're pretty good at figuring it out or predicting the next word. At least that's what it looks like from the graph. Like eight out of 10 cases, we'll get the right one. Questions before we actually validate this network, we actually run it. So I thought it was yes. noteworthy that uh, this may be the first time we've seen this in his courses, but there's no validation set in these plots. And you know, we never really want to evaluate the quality of any kind of machine learning algorithm just on how well it does in the training set. So it really appears that his validation procedure in this case is just a subjective measurement of oh how good does the poetry look coming out <laughs> yeah you know, made it kind of a fun little exercise but to, but definitely different than than the ones that preceded it i actually had a quick i was going to ask something similar to that i don't know if this is sorry if this was already covered but okay. just to clarify total words so to, total words is derived from our our data set uh and so there's no case, and I think this ties in somewhat to what Robert's pointing at broadly. Um, we're basic, it's, it's kind of like self-referential in the sense that, so we derive a um, total words and then we, we train and then we predict a new next word or set of words or you know, sequence of words that is co hopefully coherent. But we're, are, are, we're, we're pulling from total words, right? So it's not like we're, let's say we're going to speak in English. We don't grab from the broad, the accepted uh, set of English words most used or something. And then, and then interface that with our, what we learn from our particular style of using the English language, in this case, Shakespeare's way of doing it. We're, we're taking Shakespeare's stuff, uh, breaking it down pulling and, and and then and then do you see what i'm trying to say it's like a circle yeah <laughs> well um go ahead Catherine. i was just thinking i'm guessing this will be very overfitted because <clears throat> some of these words are singular and you know they're because they're older style and you know unusual contractions like uh fetus and you know things like that and, and combinations of words like Mm -hmm. Ferris creature, you know. So it's yeah. Well, I mean, we're getting pretty good at predicting the next word in a Shakespeare sonnet. Just to clarify, we're not we're not talking about English here. <laughs> the the mm -hmm. network has only seen three thousand words, so it will do its best to predict one of these next words and one of these three thousand as the next word, given mm -hmm. any any combination of one or two or three words or five words. It's basically like a large calculator where it's trying its best to remember, given these three words, which one have I seen the highest or most probable? Mm -hmm. okay. Like a very high memory calculator. <laughs> if if you wanted to validate, uh, you know, I see why it's kind of kind of a challenge, but I also understand why you do validate. Um, I'm thinking, could you, how would you do it? Number one, that's the big question. But I'm also thinking that, you know, if you, you, you would increase your, uh, the, I think what the, the uh, training set here was all of the sonnets or something like that, or all of Shakespeare. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, you, you, I guess you would do your best. You'd start with that, maybe include all the works of Shakespeare or what have you, maybe all the works of old English. And then could you like, randomly in in the or in or, you know 
rem, you know, remove a certain word throughout your, you know, I'm, I'm thinking just in, just in the same way that like in images, like say you have a million images and you just chop out a yeah. hundred thousand of them and that's going to be your validation set, let's say. Yeah. You, you would just kind of randomly remove words uh, from positions and then you would validate on those. They wouldn't be affecting your weights um, in your model, but mm -hmm. you, you would be seeing if you could, you know, how good you were at predicting those positions, I guess, in, you know, I don't know. So does that make yeah. sense? So, so in, in this case, our deviation from our usual standard of training validation test is that we just have one data set. Uh, but if you want to create a validation set, you can just probably extract, let's say, 20% of this set and make that your validation set. Uh, but our goal, again, is to generate text similar to Shakespeare's sonnets. It's not to generate text that are, con are necessarily coherent in English or, as you'll see, uh, when we test it right now, uh, let's see how do we test it. We're going to give it an input sequence. That will be our input for actually um, kickstarting this whole process. And we want to predict the next 100 words. So what that do, well, the process to do that is uh, we have an iteration here for 100 times based on how many next words we want to compute. And for each one of them, we use the C text as our, as our input to our, to our model. We need to make sure that that C text is tokenized and also is represented as a sequence. And what are we trying to do is, given this input, in this case, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope. That's actually from, from Star Wars back in the 80s, I think. <laughs> We're giving that as- 70s. 70s, good one. <laughs> I think it's the very first one, right? <laughs> yes. Um, we're giving that as, as an input to our network. It does its processing. Remember here it goes through embedding, bidirectional, dropout, LSTM, dense, dense. And the highest probability word would be, let's say, predicted. We make sure that that predicted word isn't actually in our vocabulary or not. If it's not, we're going to leave it as blank. If it is, we'll append it to our seed text. And we will we won't print the C text, we'll go back to our loop. So now we have our one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven tokens, including the comma. Now our C text is 12 tokens. And by this time, our network looks like it had predicted help me one Kenobi, you're my only hope thyself. So based on this input, the network calculated that the highest probability next word is thyself. So then we take this entire help me over one Kenobi, you're my only hope thyself. And we try to predict the next word after that. And we do this, keeping in mind there's a max length sequence that we couldn't go further because as you do this, your C becomes so large, so large, so large that you, you won't uh, probably be affordable for you to actually run your network. So we actually have a max sequence length here. And if you look at the path sequences documentation, uh, it will truncate by default to pre. So once we look that, once we uh, reach that max sequence length, basically we'll move a window. We'll have a window of max sequence length. Let's say it's it's ten. So when we reach ten, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. When we maybe ten is not a good one. Let's say twelve. When we reach twelve and we're trying to predict the next word, we're gonna drop help. We're gonna start from me all the way to desire. So we have a moving window of max length. When we do this, we do this, we do this for 100 next tokens. And if, if you look at the output here, that's, that's when the print is executed after the for loop. You might only hope thyself away desire because of for twain date of man life. It's not coherent. It doesn't make any sense, but statistically it makes a lot of sense <laughs> from a neural network perspective. And actually took the very first sentence I Googled it just to make sure that it didn't overfit or didn't remember an exact word and I couldn't find this exact combination of words. I couldn't find the beginning because that's actually from Shakespeare, but no, actually, yeah, thy self away desired because of Fort Twain. That's actually what our network created. I couldn't find anything. I could find the word desire, cross, afford, spread out in the sonnets of Shakespeare, but not next to each other. Oh. So would we shift it like that? 
does it eventually just start listing back uh, a sonnet that was matched exactly? Because we're feeding it stuff that it generated. Yeah, so that would be the case of overfitting. If you're actually remembering all the combinations of words and what comes after that, that would be the case. Uh, we're, we're fitting it something that has never seen. Like this sentence, I'm pretty sure doesn't exist in Shakespeare. So that's <laughs> number one. <laughs> oh, I had a question about that, George. It, uh, obviously, that sentence doesn't exist in Shakespeare, but um, specifically, you know, like I'm sure you can find some of those words and not others. So like help and me and your, yep. maybe not yep. even your, but, but Obi-Wan Kenobi. So I, I'm s uh, what exactly does it do with the information that is contained within the set and information that isn't? And how does yeah. that affect things? If we did another sentence that included only words that, you know, you see my point. So when, when we do this tokenization, this text to sequence, uh, these words that we haven't seen before, well, they'll yeah. be coded as out of vocabulary tokens. So they, they would have a special, like a zero value, for example. So it'd be help me, zero, 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 one, five, two, seven. I just made out those tokens. Those yeah. index. And based on the network, what you've seen, what the network has seen in the past, for this combination of input, the highest probability one is thyself. Maybe thyself is the most popular word in the sonnet itself. Like, that would be a very good guess, right? Just give out the most probable one. Or the most popular one but then as you combine words and words and words you're actually forming sentences then your network is not just going to predict the most um, popular one but actually look at the previous input the previous the previous hidden states since we're using other stamps and we'll hop with the next word it's, it's okay. interesting where sorry it's, it's interesting where it predicts to put in a uh, uh, apostrophes apostrophe yeah, yeah. Not only that, but it, it, as, as the deeper you go, you will see that you're going to run into issues where you actually repeat the same word, like right, right, right. Yeah, several instances of that. Like your network has maybe not seen this combination of words before. I tried this with another input. Um, no, I tried it with the same input, but running it again just to make sure that um, just, to, just, to, just to make sure that it's not this is really impacted by. Uh, by your initialization and hopefully the initialization are random. So you can see that through my only hope of every pen shows no confounds, dying, dying. There's some repetition here. Um, usually repetitions are a result of RNNs from what I've seen online. But again, I Googled. Clear with the with a given network, the process is deterministic, right? In order to get another sentence, you have to retrain this network. Uh, that's because we're always taking the most likely token. Uh, there's another thing that you could do, take random sampling based on the different softmax probabilities. And I think he talked about that maybe at the end, or maybe that was just in the link that they provided to the TensorFlow documentation. Are, are you saying how can I have this exact same output? Well, no, I'm saying that uh, if you ran it with the exact same model, again and the same input you should get the exact same output. Same input. yeah why does it why is it different is so, because you, you retrained the model i'm assuming no i didn't retrain it no this is not this is not a deterministic uh model uh, there are weight matrices and biases that are initialized every time you run them but hold on I think, yeah, I think there's some, some randomness uh, every time you run it. You're not retraining it, so the way the biases, you're right, they're fixed, but there must be some other initialization or some other randomness when you actually do the predict. So I actually Googled it a lot because- it, it does, the does the, would the dropout affect that? No. Um, no, the dropout is only done during training, not during yeah. inference. So your weight and biases, you're right, Robert, they're fixed, but uh, I think TensorFlow has a lot of randomness when you do predict. And I was looking online a while ago, uh, people who deal with like biological experiments or actually want to have reproducible results using DNN or CNN or RNN. Yeah. Like in theory, you should be able to, right? So I found out that you have to do two things. One is you have to fix a seed of TensorFlow. TensorFlow has a seed function. You have to fix it every time you run the experiment. Another one is that wasn't enough. Internally, TensorFlow uses NumPy, and NumPy has its own seed. 
So you have to fix both the NumPy and the TensorFlow C, then you'll get the reduced flow results. So I, I, I've always seen that in the training. If you want to get the same training result, you've got to put, you know, the TensorFlow seed, you've got to do NumPy seed, you've got to do uh, the import random and do the random seed because NumPy uses random. Mm -hmm. There's like, there's like 10 different, and I've always thought that if it was when you get the same training result, I didn't think the predict, predict method actually had a random part to it, had any randomization. Um, I can't tell, like from here it looks like it does because I'm getting for the exact same input, completely different output. Right. So. Why is that a thing though? So like, uh, like why would they incorporate that, the predict model? And like, does that affect, like what is the purpose behind it being different every time you run it if you're trying to keep, so if you're trying to predict the thing? Yeah. I'm not sure what's the reason behind the, the, the predict, but in, in general, in, in, in neural networks, you want to shuffle, you want to randomize your input so that you're not fine tuning, you're not finding features that maybe is the index of your, of your input. You're, you're not basically looking for features that are not important or not valid. Because let's say you have, um, you have some kind of index in your input, then your output would basically map just the index to the label. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of shuffling and there's a lot of randomness every time you would train. In this case, it looks like there is a randomness when you predict as well, and you just have to do some digging around of documentation of where that is. And you said you could turn it off by fixing the seeds? Yeah. Interesting. Cool. Then on the tutorials on TensorFlow, there's actually another model. Um, I think it's doing, um, so we did word, next word predictions. I think there's another network that does next character prediction. That's called character level uh, text generation. You're not predicting the next word, you're actually predicting the next character. And I think it was trained in a similar corpus as, as before. And you can see a simple output here where it looks like it's written by Shakespeare, but if you try to read it, maybe it doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, again, the words here might not make any sense because you're actually predicting the next character. So you're doing character level language modeling. But some of the words look English, right? Or are English. How do thou was force? Looks mm -hmm. English to me. So Lawrence didn't go into it here, but a lot of times one of the ways to improve this kind of prediction is um, they call it a beam search. And basically you track up to like you know any as many words you want but let's say you got the first one you would track like the uh the probabilities that were highest for the first for for the first word for two of the outcomes and then you'd run it again given those two outcomes and predict the next word and you might do that three times and you will then look at the probabilities for all those combinations and see which one's the highest and that's the one you would use for the three next words. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of, it's, it's an expensive, you know, thing to do, but it's, I think uh, Andrew discussed it in his class, uh, Beam yeah. Search. Yeah, Andrew, Andrew discussed it, yeah, yeah. Uh, he didn't mention it here, but yeah, I agree with you that you basically explore three different networks in parallel, and you're trying to see which combination of words is the most probable, and you only keep that, or tokens in this case. Cool. Some other applications I wanted to share with you. Uh, this is from Andrew's actually course uh, where I trained on a corpus of dinosaur names. And the goal was to predict the next or a new dinosaur name. And you can see after like 30 something thousand iterations, you could kind of see some kind of like dinosaurish looking names. So you figured out that the source actually is a dinosaur name. <laughs> uh, Spanded, I'm not sure what that is. Thorhimiliosaurus, Onyx, probably that's a dinosaur name. Makes, I think it makes snail. Uh, so I kind of figured out some, some kind of word characterization. And you might like this, Robert. Then another one was to train on uh, predicting notes from a musical uh, notebook or context. And I think it was like a jazz solo. And let's see what it predicted. This one. Yeah, go ahead. 
That was from Andrew's class? That was from Andrew's class. Yeah, the last, the very last uh, sequence. Uh, I, I vaguely remember there was an exercise in there where, where you uh, like coded your own jazz generator, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's not really jazz ready, but <laughs> it has some vibes to it. <laughs> Uh, some other applications, um, just to wrap up here, but um, this is trained on speeches from President Obama and this is what it came up with. The United States will step up to the cost of a new, of a new challenges of the American people that will share the fact that we created a problem. So it makes sense at the beginning, but after a while, like, it doesn't make much sense. And one, one something I want to point out is that uh, I'd be here in, in the um, Stanford class mentions is that the examples you see online are usually the cherry pick ones. So just because yeah. this example doesn't mean that your network is, you know, always this good. Like these are the, the very cherry pick ones, and in, in some cases maybe human edited, which mm. kind, of, kind of breaks the you know makes the game unfair. Mm -hmm. But this was one example. Another one was on Harry Potter. Actually, I like the quotes here. Uh, Sorry, Harry shouted, panicking. I leave these rooms in London. Are they okay? It looks, it sounds English, and, but it's not very much. Yeah. Uh, another one I've, I've kind of liked was on recipe. <laughs> so this one is trying to make a chocolate ranch barbecue. <laughs> you all know it's very famous. <laughs> You're going to need a lot of Parmesan cheese, <laughs> some coconut oh, milk, <laughs> three eggs. <laughs> the execution is kind of. Uh, uh, Filled with flaws, but you place your pasta over layers of lumps. I don't know what that means. You shape them, you mix them with oranges and cheese. Some, at some point, you serve them hot, and there's an oven at some point. Yeah, moderate oven, simmer. So, you, I doubt you're going to make anything tasty, but I found it interesting, you know. And also, the structure. Was, was this trade not like uh, you took a bunch of recipes and then you just fed it the title? Or did it generate the title itself, or so did you feed it the title? Yeah, I, I didn't feed it, but yeah, this gives, yeah, this, this GitHub uh, repository probably has more information, but it looks like a, a, a whole corpus of recipes, and it looks like recipes were exactly structured the same. Title, categories, okay. yield, the ingredients, and how many <laughs> tablespoon accounts, and the actual implementation. <laughs> Reminds me of my first uh, um, project back in 1981, actually 82, <laughs> in basic. I took, I had to take Jabberwock, break it into all the parts of speech and code it to create something new that you basically reused all the words with the right parts of speech, but it was all in a different order. <laughs> Interesting. And another one is, I think this was trained on paint color code. So this, you see this color codes here, 231, 137, 165. That's the RGB probably color code for a, a paint. And it was trained to generate paint color, paint color names. So this is Casty Pink, Power Pink, <laughs> Able Tan. I'm not sure, but these names look kind of funny. And actually, if you put them on a paint store, people are like, hey, I want this toner blue or whatever. I want the... the <laughs> The, right. They must have very <laughs> results. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, but George, if you if, if when you look at the first one, Gasty is, is cool. That's like a, I don't know what that means. But I then, don't pink, know what that is, then but... pink, pink is right. But then if you look at the second one with gray, that's power is nice because it's, right. it's kind of strong. But then gray is incorrect. No, it's that, but the gray also means... matches the color, right? The pink also matches the color. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, like some of it is uh, kind of more objective. And some of it is interesting, gener uh, like cr kind of like creative uh, adjectives, and you can see the conflict there. Pink it matches, <laughs> but now look at grade bat. Neither of those over on the right there. Neither of those are um, necessarily point to the fact that that's green. So they kind of work because they're not wrong, I guess. But if that were to say like grade uh, blue bat, then it would be false. You know what I mean? Yeah. We also have grass bat, which is actually yeah. Um, Reddish, reddish tone. Cindus poop. It's <laughs> not brown. The poop and the turdly is a little <laughs> bit. It's, it's Thank you. Thank you. Just, However, I do like stoner blue. Yeah. Stoner blue. Well, when you're stoned, things may not look blue. <laughs> <laughs> this, this was nope. this, this generated using a character level language model. So it was actually predicting uh -huh. character, character, character. But I'm surprised 
that actually the color names came up properly for some yeah. of them. Again, this might be cherry picked, right? I, I, I think but it was given <laughs> it was given the names with the act the real color. So this was like uh, supervised, right? Supervised machine learning. It was given. It was given um, RGB and the actual color names. Okay. So it was given actual numbers, and the label was the the color name. Yeah, and then it was it was fed like random it generates random like colors right then yeah then uh then yeah i think if you if you give this as input it'll create this as an output yeah so it, the rgb are actually inputs to the model and it's predicting the the words yeah i think yeah the rgb is the input and the word is the output so the rgb is the input sequence and the word is the output sequence Uh, I mentioned this blog post from Andre uh, last time, but he also goes into uh, some other interesting generations. I'll quickly uh, skim them. Uh, let me zoom in a little bit. This is the same architecture that we saw above. Um, some simple code, how to do your own language model. Um, he has a generator from Paul Graham, the founder of Y Combinator. He was actually able to train it and create text after it. Some Shakespeare that we saw before. Um, I'll go to this, some uh, interesting ones. Some Wikipedia articles that was trained on Wikipedia and actually uh, learn how to create links, right? Or um, punctuation or links to other websites or sites. That was interesting. Um, or even XML. Another one was on algebraic geometry. This is actually generated from, <laughs> from an RNN. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> so if you read it, you might say, "Hmm, actually, what?" <laughs> some case it gets lost. It's it my brother. Seriously. You could no, probably get this past some people. <laughs> <laughs> question mark. Question mark. He had Ed. to. Uh, he had to fix a couple of things to get the LaTeX code to compile. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Wow. Not much. <laughs> he actually uh, he has the actual yeah compile yeah LaTeX code. It wouldn't compile that. Yeah. yeah that's right. Here's another one with, with actual. Limas, proofs, skipped, or something like that. Sometimes it says skip for reader. <laughs> Sometimes it actually has geometrical representations. Um, and this is the, the athletic code here. So it knows how to begin proof. Sometimes it forgets to end proof. Uh, begin lima or end lima. That was interesting. So another thing that's really interesting here is that this article is actually five years old. And this was using, I think, just a a standard RNN, right? Uh, I think so, yeah, on a mixed character RNN, yeah. There's a so paper that's there. That's why I failed at some of those long range things like begin, um, you know, begin proof and then it forgets what tag it was beginning and ends the lemma instead yep. of. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Uh, Linux or C source code or C++ source code. You look at it from far away, it makes sense. I doubt it will compile though. <laughs> um, you know, it's amazing, even though it's not, you know, that good, it's amazing that this is generated it, from scratch. I mean, it's really mind blowing, I think. I find it overwhelming. <laughs> then some of the cherry pick examples, and we're looking at text, and they were actually looking at, so the hidden state, you were looking at the different neurons in that hidden state. And they were looking at, they were overlaying that with your input sequence. And I think they found some neurons in that hidden state that get most excited when something happens. So they output a high value when something happens. That something happens like this specific neuron in one of the hidden layers gets excited when it says a www.something.com or www.something.co. Basically it gets really excited when it sees hyperlinks. Um, another one maybe when it sees, uh, parentheses or brackets. Uh, some other ones that uh, kind of get excited when a sentence ends. So if they start with a low value, then they get higher, higher value, the deeper you are in a sentence. Some other ones that get really excited when, uh, when you're outside of quotes. So there's a quote here, doo -doo -doo, ends here. Then this neuron is tracking, okay, you're outside of quote. Another one that's kind of keeping track of how deep in a for loop you are in that C code that we saw the Linux source, Linux source code. Another one, if you're inside a comment or not. 
Um, yeah, but he also mentioned that some of them or most of them didn't make much sense. I think these are just the, the cherry pick ones. Cool. Uh, are, are all of those, okay, I don't, is the paradigm, you know, just, just, to, just to flog this uh, validation thing, um, is the paradigm for word selection or sentence completion or whatever you call this? Um, you, you, model. I'm sorry? Language model. Okay. Um, uh, you, you, you don't try to validate um, and I'm thinking it seems like you could, and that if you did, I I, I would, and, and then and then use the validation feedback to improve your training. It seems like you might get more reasonable uh, results. Just uh, yeah. So yeah, so these papers that uh, that I mentioned here, they actually do a validation. They actually look at this perplexity uh, metric. Excuse me, one second. In our case, we didn't do this perplexity metric. We didn't validate them against the validation set. So, oh. am I trying to publish something? You better validate it. So, wait, so how does validation work? So they check to see like what is the probability of like uh, that it gets the correct that it makes sense. So yes, yeah, so you see, uh, for a given input, uh, you have a label. What is the next output? Uh -huh. you, you you compare that with your output uh -huh. and the further those words are uh, the more penalized your model is the more your lo the higher your loss is then you change your weight matrices again and again and hopefully uh, the next word you predict for a given input will match the actual label so your goal is to minimize this loss which <clears throat> translates to minimizing this perplexity metric that's like the cost function yeah, this is the cost function. This is J of theta. Yeah, theta is your parameters. Could be matrices, biases. And just to be clear, this is evaluating the model with a metric. This is not talking about what I think Martin might be talking about is using a validation set. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. No, yeah, and I'm, I'm I think most most formal, you know, these big models and the training they do, they're using validation sets to make sh sure they're not overfitting. You know, it's, it's something right. they do during training. They mm -hmm. do, a lot of times they do uh, what's called um, um, cross validation. With, yes, uh, right. Uh, those kind of routines, so. And, and cross validation is basically, and it's like if you have a very small, uh, you, you know, like, like I would consider like the set of all sonnets to be a fairly small, uh, training set. So basically on validation, you would just kind of randomly, you know, knock out things and use the same yeah. training set, but just with pulling out different things. Is that correct? Um, it's, it's a way of partitioning your set and, and, you know, going across easily, you do it in terms of, but you're right. You would use it with a smaller <laughs> training set. ways, right? You do it, you use the same set, but you validate on different subsets, let's say. Yes, as you train and you train on the other ones, and then you you use that to see which one did the best. Yeah. The, um, but you're right. Usually, use cross validation on a smaller data set. If you have a really large data set, that you you figure that you've got good a good distribution of 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 what you're trying to you know the features, and so you can just you can just take like you know we talked about this I think a couple of times ago about how big a validation set to use. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. Um, just, I think, a couple more slides, then we're going to wrap up. I know we're on over time, but um, just because we talked about next word generation, next token generation, uh, that doesn't mean that we cannot combine what we've seen in the past with convolutional neural networks or image processing with sequence generation. That's what we're doing here. So there are a lot of people, a lot of papers have been written with, for example, solving the problem of caption generation, where you have an input, uh, an image as an input, you run that through a, a CNN, a convolutional deep, a convolutional layer. You come up with a, right before the softmax layer, you remove that. You come up with that rich uh, layer representation. That will be your your input here, and this is your input V. And now you're modifying your your neural network before you had 
or input X, which would be a, a token or a word if you're hidden state. Now you're actually adding a new uh, matrix that you need to train and a new vector. That vector will be fed by your CNN. So you do that and you have a new matrix and to train on to learn and you pass that through your uh, uh, RNA network and hopefully uh, when you do this, um, your network should predict uh, something that is a caption of, of this image. And we'll look at some examples. But the goal is you have an image, you pass it through a CNN, you get that rich representation, you feed that as an input only once to your RNN, um, and that your RNN starts to generate based on this rich uh, input, the next token and the next token. So it looks like in this case, it's predicting straw hat. There are some papers here that go through this process. These are some examples, um, some cherry pick, and I'll also show you some failure examples, but um, given this image, it predicted a cat sitting on a suitcase on the floor. Pretty good. Cat is sitting on a tree branch. A dog is running in the grass with a frisbee. Pretty good, right? Like something that, you know, I, I think did a pretty good job. Looking at some other ones that didn't do so well, a woman is holding a cat in her hand, maybe the fur threw off the network, a person holding a computer mouse on a desk, maybe this RSA key fob threw off the network, maybe has never seen a, such a device. A woman standing on a beach holding a surfboard, maybe this direction made the network think that this is a surfboard. A bird is perched on a tree branch, maybe it saw a lot of branch trees and birds together. Bobby. <laughs> Isn't that a bird there? Uh, uh, I don't see one. If you see, no, I I see a spider web. Spider web. <laughs> oh, there's a bird in the background that, or maybe that's just me, you know. But there's a there's a bird back there. I don't know if you see. It, so. I know. <laughs> a man in a baseball uniform throwing a ball. Like maybe you know, I've seen a lot of images of baseball players throwing a ball, but not maybe not catching it. So it doesn't really understand the difference. Um, and some extension of using uh, computer vision with sequence model or NLP. Another one is based on attention where you're generating a caption. Not only that, but you also are, are specifically outputting which part of your image made you classify or generate that caption. So in this case, we're looking at this caption or this image. The caption was a woman is throwing a frisbee in a park. There's another mechanism called attention layer, attention mechanism that allows you to basically enhance your network and see that this part of the image is actually what drove you to use the word frisbee. Or a dog is standing in the hardwood floor, this part of the image actually uh, drove you to generate the word dog. Or a stop sign, this part, little girl, group of people, Trees, trees like, so the wider the, the background, the more, the higher the value is. So if you see here, anything but the giraffe is the trees. So that was from this paper show at Dan and Tell in 2015. You know, like, uh, I, I'm always amazed that when I, I, I'll do a Google search and then, you know, click on images and, and you get the pretty good sometimes things like you were just showing. Does anybody know, like, the models that, you know, Google goes about doing its Google images? So if you looked at like uh, ImageNet or any of those competitions, they have all these, uh, you know, 10,000 different cl classifications of things that can be, and they, they look at all these images and try to class. So they, Google probably has, you know, a much more extensive <laughs> database to train on, but that's, that's essentially the same thing. So it, it's basically a very, very fancy uh, convolution neural networks. Okay. So it's not, not, not but not, LSTMs um, or combination. The, Are you talking about an image net? I'm talking about, I'm, no, when you, when, you, when you put a term into Google, you have the option of clicking on images. Oh, okay. And, it'll, yes. and it comes up with some things, you know, like I'm sure it would easily get woman throwing a Frisbee in a park. And, uh, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. And I'm always amazed. I'm just wondering, you know, what models if anybody knows what models they use. And I agree, it's probably, they, they certainly have a lot more, a lot of data I and mean, that's good. You know, but yeah, I don't think they're given the image and producing the caption and then trying to match your word, your sentence or whatever to captions. 
I think they have the captions and the images already. Uh, okay. I mean, you're giving it the caption essentially with your search term, you know? Yeah. Um, so I don't know how that. Yeah. And, and a lot of times when people upload things, maybe they add some metadata, like what is this about? So oh, right. maybe that's just classical data management, but yeah, I agree. Maybe Google goes through some kind of indexing for, I don't know which sites, maybe the popular sites and then maybe indexes the images to captions. And then when you enter a caption, it, it just tries to pair it back to you. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Cool. Friends, that was it. That was a long uh, session. I'm glad that you're here. This is the end. We're not going to go any further, but this is week four of course three on natural language processing in TensorFlow. And for some of you like Bishoy who are new, uh, if you check out um, our oh. here, I just want to mention our deep learning PF. We have all our previous recordings here and the previous one that we were mentioned above is, is right over here. Can you put that in the chat? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, thank you. Oh. Really good, George. And yeah, well, that was great. Yeah, thank you, friends. We won't have time to go through uh, the, the fun deep learning trivia. Uh, we can do that offline or we can do it on uh, next time. But this was a lot of context and appreciate it. I have some extra slides here on, on some tutorials, uh, some specializations that have come up on healthcare some books that i recommend but yeah uh thanks for for joining us and yeah hope to see you next time on, uh, on our happy hour no no slides no recording just just a fun hangout with you guys thanks again george cool yeah, thanks a lot thanks, thanks. everyone thank you so thanks. much